All right, hey friends, welcome to Classic Skin Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today we're actually going to be taking a look at something a little bit different from what we usually do. One of my primary fields of study slash research is what we now might call science in the ancient world. So I love looking at what people were learning and thinking, but I also like looking at what did they think about what they were thinking or what were the attitudes towards science? Because it's easy to remember that there've always been some people who hated science, who feared it, demonized it because of the change it might bring, but it's a little bit harder to wrap your mind around people who didn't hate science or fear it, they just derided it. They thought it was stupid, irrelevant, useless. Uh, they thought of studying science in the way some people today might think of getting an arts degree. They just thought it was useless. And that, from the perspective of someone living in 2020, is kind of a strange take. And also, from the perspective of someone who is a humanities student, it's very satisfying. So this mindset is what we're going to be exploring today. In the 1600s in Europe, it was very fashionable, especially for the aristocracy, to be disdainful of, to make fun of what they would call natural philosophers and natural philosophy. An example of this is found in a comedy called The Virtuoso that was written by Thomas Shadwell. In this comedy, there's a character named Sir Nicholas. He is a natural philosopher or a scientist, and he is described as follows. A sot that has spent 2,000 pounds in microscopes to find out the nature of eels in vinegar, mites in cheese, and the blue of plums which he has suddenly found out to be living creatures. One who has broken his brains about the nature of maggots, who has studied these 20 years to find out the several sorts of spiders, and never cares for understanding mankind. So obviously this character is meant to be comical, the butt of the joke. He's spent his life studying molds that have benefited no one. Uh, it's kind of sad. But to look at a more serious example, this next quote comes from a gentleman named Sir William Temple. He was a diplomat and an advisor to King Charles II, so a rather important person. And he wrote an essay called Upon the Gardens of Epicurus. And in this passage, he is contrasting ancient Greek philosophy. So Epicurus is an ancient Greek philosopher who definitely has an interest in nature, but his primary goal is in helping humans achieve what we might call inner peace or something like that in their lives. And the study of nature is a much more secondary goal. So Sir William Temple is contrasting that ancient goal philosophy with issues that he sees in modern natural philosophy or science. Moral philosophy appears to have an end not only desirable by every man, which is the ease and happiness of life, but also in some degree suitable to the force and reach of human nature. For as to that part of philosophy which is called natural, I know no end it can have but that of busying a man's brains to no purpose, or satisfying the vanity so natural to most men of distinguishing themselves by some way or other from those that seem their equals in birth and the common advantages of it. More than this, I know no advantage mankind has gained by the progress of natural philosophy. During so many ages, it has had vogue in the world, accepting always and very justly what we owe to the mathematics, but all the different schemes of nature that have been drawn of old or of late by Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, Descartes, Hobbes, or any other that I know of, seem to agree but in one thing, which is the want of demonstration or satisfaction to any thinking and unpossessed man and seem more or less probable one than another according to the wit and eloquence of the authors and advocates that raise or defend them." Now, if I can try to summarize what he's saying here, he's making two big objections against science. First, that it hasn't done anything to really help people. It's been a lot of fun, it's really interesting, but has it made anyone happier? Has it helped people to understand one another, to connect better, to communicate more efficiently? Mm, in his opinion, not so much. And secondly, that while there are many great scientific theories and everyone can put forward great arguments in defense of theirs, everyone else can as well. So we have all these theories and everyone is arguing and there's no way to 
prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that any one of these is the ultimate truth. And our knee-jerk reaction to that might be, uh. And to be fair, this essay was published in 1690, so he hadn't seen airplanes and men going to the moon and telephones and all of that great stuff, but I think that both of his points still can be defended to some extent. First off, yes, science has done amazing things, very grateful, but are people on average happier? Are people on average better at communicating, more connected? I'm not an expert on that particular topic, but it seems like we're just as miserable and hating each other and fighting each other just as much as we have always been. And there hasn't actually been that much of a change there. And second, while yes, we have proven some things that the sun is at the center of the solar system, we've proven all kinds of things, but there are lots of things that we're still no closer to proving that we just kind of have to live with and we're still hunting for the answers for and that we may never get the answers for. So while yes, we have proved some things, the problem of ultimately proving everything is uh, still a problem. Sir William Temple was not alone in this belief. Like I said, it was pretty popular. A lot of people shared this mindset. Not everyone, of course. There were a lot of people who admired the Greek philosophers, not just because they tried to make people happy, but because they were some of the first people ever to be hesitant to explain the universe in terms of the gods, spirituality, religion, superstition, and to try to explain things through reason. A lot of natural philosophers really admired this approach, were inspired by it, and took it up as their own personal calling. And Newton was one of these people. He was busy doing his own thing, publishing his works. And as the preface for one of his publications, Haley of Comet fame wrote a preface uh, in poem form. It was this giant poem uh, to go in front of one of Newton's works that praised Newton and specifically calls him as one of those great ancient philosophers, if not greater, because Newton is taking on the glorious task of proving that the universe does not depend on the machinations of gods. And sadly, <laughs> Haley's approach didn't actually help the cause of science, if anything, it hurt it, because Haley was a confirmed skeptic and probably an atheist, and so he was pretty unpopular and generally persecuted by the church and by religious people, and so this put the Royal Society of Sciences in a bit of an uncomfortable position. They are the royal society after all. So they depend on the king, they depend on his patronage for their continued existence. And Sir William Temple and his opinions all have the ear of the king. Presumably he's gonna be influenced by them. So they are pretty worried. They managed to survive, however, um, mostly for two reasons. One, they get lucky. There's a revolution, the king changes, and general fashions and opinions shift. And two, they undertake a PR campaign. So they get a hold of Reverend Bentley and they have him edit Haley's poem without Haley's permission. He goes through and he scratches out all the stuff that might be interpreted as heretical or atheistic. And two, he gives a speech and he promotes Newton's work as proof of divine providence. So he says that all of Newton's discoveries that have to do with the natural laws of the universe are proof that God designed everything purposefully. He created everything with this beautiful order and symmetry and regularity. And so he says that what Newton is doing is supporting Christianity and the church. So in an interesting way, science and the, this society and Newton's work and all of this manages to survive by sort of subordinating itself to religion or you could say just to the popular worldview of the time, which is not a great look for science nowadays. <laughs> it is certainly not what science is going for. Ultimately, I think everything worked out just fine for natural philosophy. They seem to be doing great. 
but I do enjoy this story in a very vindictive way. <laughs> I appreciate that there was a point in time when the sciences were trembling in their boots and they were on the chopping block. Less vindictively, I think that this story gives me hope that just because something seems like it's a little irrelevant or a little obtuse doesn't mean that at core it is or that it will always continue to be. I think there are things in the humanities that are a little overlooked now but that are important and useful and I hope that in the future there will continue to be even more of these things uh, until it gets to the point where the humanities demand, they command the attention and the respect that the sciences do now and that maybe someday we will live in a utopia where both are equally appreciated, respected, and used. Maybe I'm hoping for too much, but I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are. Let me know in the comments. And thank you so much for watching. Special thank you as always to subscribers and to Patreon members, and I hope to see all of you again next week. Karate.